Today's program will be a brief presentation from University of Chicago Crime Lab, um, Dr. Jens Ludwig, and Chicago Public School CEO Pedro Martinez, before Laura Thon of PwC joins for a conversation moderated by Chicago Sun-Times' Lorraine Forte. Um, I don't think I need to introduce, please indulge me just for a second before you start talking. Um, I don't think I need to introduce Dr. Ludwig to anybody, do I? Okay, so what I'm going to say is if I do, read his bio. That's, you know, pick up his bio. Um, founded the crime lab, you know, all that stuff. One of the smartest guys in the world, that whole kind of thing. And I think everyone in the room also knows um, Dr. Martinez, as well as our other guests. So I'm going to ask Jens, and Jens, we'll get you something to eat, because I know you probably haven't eaten, but we'll get you a take, take home. He's going to come on up, and he's going to get started, because like I said, we are moving at lightning speed today. Jens? Thank you so much, Thank you so much Dr. Ludwig. Uh, good afternoon. Why are you all inside? It's 50 degrees out. As it always is in Chicago uh, in February. Um, thank you so much for, uh, for having me. What I, what I wanted to do for starters is, you know, we've spent the last four years staring at the trees of the pandemic. And I just want to zoom back for a second and remind us of the forest that we've just been through. So we are coming out of the tail end of a once a century global public health crisis of the sort that nobody alive today has ever seen. Uh, the last time this happened on Earth was in 1919 at the end of World War I. So this really is a unique historical moment, crisis that we've just gone through that created a once a century public education crisis as well. If you think about how public education has developed gradually over hundreds of years to develop a public school system of the sort that we had as of Mar early March 2020, and then in, the, in a literally a matter of weeks, schools all across the world had to completely reinvent and reimagine what they're doing. Okay, so we have asked a lot of our kids, we've asked a lot of our parents, we've asked a lot of our public school systems to deal with something that is just intrinsically, fundamentally, incredibly, incredibly uh, difficult and rare. And what I wanted to do uh, today is, is uh, talk a little bit about um, why this is, to me, this is one of the biggest issues that we're not talking nearly enough about, given its importance. And I want to argue that there's good news here, there's a solution, and there's even better news here that CPS is one of the nation's leaders in fixing it. And really what I want to do is just plea for everybody who cares about the city of Chicago to help figure out a way to get CPS additional resources to do even more of what they're, of what they're doing. Um, okay. So if you think about how we've done with the public health crisis, um, we're on the tail end of this. You go to the airport, you go to an a indoor concert, nobody's wearing masks anymore, okay? If you think about how we're doing with the public education crisis, um, much less well, right? In, in many ways, we're still right in the thick of the public, uh, public education crisis. One way to see this is national data. We have gold standard uh, information about what's going on at the national level because the National Assessment of Education Progress, what people call the nation's report card, does an amazingly good job of tracking what is happening to student learning for the same type of student over long periods of time using exactly the same sort of test. So that's very rare to be able to do that, so it gives us a very unique window into what's going on. The downside is that that's a national picture, not local to the city of Chicago, but if you look at the national data, so this is test scores relative to 2012 as a benchmark, and you can see, so every line here is for kids at different cut points in the distribution. The kids at the top are the kids who are ahead at the beginning. The kids at the bottom here were the lowest performing students. You can see that nationally test scores have completely fallen off a cliff, especially for the kids at the bottom of the test score distribution. That's in reading. And when you look at math, you see exactly the same thing. Okay, and this is current through 2023. Okay, this is current through 2023, and you can see at the national level, there's very little evidence of much progress on the, on the problem. Okay, um, so 
I want to just pause for a second and, and ask or wonder why we've made so much less progress on solving the once a century public education crisis compared to the once a century public health crisis. And one hypothesis that I've wondered about is whether the problem here is that we haven't had the same type of gripping or disturbing visuals for the public, public education crisis as with the public health crisis. So this is what we spent four years seeing on our web browsers and our newspapers, right? The public health crisis here was incredibly moving and incredibly salient because we were exposed to these images all the time. This is the image of pandemic learning loss, right? It's a kid who is now half a year to a year behind grade level. The teacher is teaching grade level content. They're not quite getting it the way they used to. It's just not nearly the same sort of compelling visual as one candidate explanation for why we don't have our hair on fire for the learning loss problem as, uh, as with COVID. We need to. We as a country need, we as a country, we as a city need to have our hair on fire as much about the learning loss problem as about COVID because the stakes are at least as big. The stakes are at least as big. So um, we have a lot of education people in the room who know this much better than I do, but there, we know that there are very key, key developmental milestones that kids need to reach, right? If you cannot read by the end of third grade, your risk of dropping out of high school increases by a factor of four. If you have not completed your required algebra class by the end of ninth grade, your risk of dropping out of high school goes up by a factor of five. Okay, we have a whole gen, there were 50 million kids of school age when the pandemic hit, who have almost all been shifted back between a half a year and a year. The most disadvantaged kids affected the most. They are at huge risk for missing these key developmental milestones. The time to act is now. The time to act was yesterday to solve this problem, okay? So why is this such a big problem? Well, we know we know that in the modern economy, education is the most important pathway for low-income kids to avoid being low-income adults. If this loss of a half a year of learning on average persists, if we don't fix this, this will be, in present value terms, $100,000 lost lifetime earnings for the kids in Chicago if we don't fix this problem. That's a lot of money. That's a lot of money, right? And because this problem hits the most disadvantaged kids the most, this is going to make our problems with income inequality and wealth inequality all the worse. What about for the city of Chicago as a whole? Well, we know the most important protective factor against violence involvement is a high school diploma. If we've got a bunch of kids who were shifted now and, and never get back on track educationally, for the city of Chicago, this means a 14% increase in murder rates in the future, that's 85 more murders every year, year after year, if we don't fix this problem. Another way to think about this is if you just looked at the public opinion surveys around the most recent mayoral race, far and away the number one concern of people in Chicago was gun violence. If we don't fix the learning loss problem today, we are guaranteeing that 10 or 20 years from now, Gun violence is going to remain the number one concern of every voter in the city of Chicago. We just absolutely have to fix this. Let me just give you one more, um, before I, I turn to the optimistic conclusion here, the optimistic part of the talk, let me just give you one other reason why your hair needs to be on fire about this. So Chicago developed because of our location. We were where the, the Great Lakes meets the Mississippi River in a world where everything uh, travels by boat. That's not the world we live in anymore. That's not the thing that determines economic success in 2024. Ed Glazer at Harvard has done a study that shows the number one predictor of economic growth is median January temperature. <laughs> that does not play to Chicago's strengths. Number two, the second most important thing of a uh, of predictor of how well a, a city will do economically is the educational attainment of its population. If we want a thriving city of Chicago, we need to fix this problem. It's just critically, critically, critically important. Okay, now the good news is that we know the pedagogical solution to this. Okay, we, and in fact, we've known it since the 12th century at Oxford University. 
The best way to teach anyone anything is to put them one-on-one -on -one in a room with an adult to walk them through, right? So this is not rocket science. The big challenge here is not how do we greatly accelerate student learning, it's figuring out how to do this at scale. And uh, we're lucky as Chicago residents to have the nation's leader at figuring out how to scale this sort of tutoring, which is the Chicago Public Schools. They have figured out a way to do Oxford-style tutoring at something much closer to American public school prices and start doing this at much larger scale. And in some of the work that our University of Chicago Research Center has been lucky enough to do with CPS, we can see the result is double or triple learning. What works at Oxford works on the south and west sides of Chicago as well. So a great testament to CPS that they were doing this work before the pandemic and were ready to do one of the most effective evidence-based things after that. This is why the US Secretary of Education, when he was handing out $190 billion to districts around the country, said, put that money into tutoring. This is the best way to accelerate student learning and overcome pandemic learning loss. And in a world in which, as you saw coming in the front door, we don't always have harmonious, perfectly harmonious labor management relation, relations, just the other day, the NEA president came out and said, tutoring is amazing, right? This is what we need to do. We, the teachers of the country, think this is the thing that we need to do to get our kids back on track. So everybody can see it. Um, and CPS is a national leader. The challenge is, the challenge is that we don't have enough money as a city to do this. Sorry, I'm, I'm, I'll be done in one minute, CEO Martinez. So we've done a little back of the envelope math. How much would it take to give tutoring to catch every, half of kids in CPS up? It would be 660 million. How much do we have as federal money for tutoring right now as the federal dollars are winding down? $25 million. All right, so you can see that the resources are not commensurate with the, with the need. Okay, so the last thing that I want to, uh, so the problem is not that we don't know what to do, we just need more resources to help CPS do a lot more of this. Okay, I just wanna say two last things um, before I sit, turn it over to CEO Martinez. So uh, Stanford and Harvard came out with some data the other day that some of you might have read about in the Chicago Sun-Times that showed that for Chicago, like with many cities around the country, the progress in overcoming the, the pandemic is mixed. There are some parts to the Stanford-Harvard data that we'll talk about during the panel Q&A that I think might be sort of slightly overly optimistic, and we can talk more about the, about the details, but I think everybody would agree that we have lots more progress, lots more progress that we need to make, especially when you think that we wanted to make lots, we needed to do lots of progress even before the pandemic as well. Um, but I wanted to just close by echoing something um, that the chief education officer of CPS said in the Sun-Times um, uh, yesterday. Um, she said, we're looking to make a call to everyone um, the state, federal elected officials, community-based organizations, philanthropies to continue to help us, CPS, and to help us in bigger ways so that we can sustain these initiatives and make more progress. And I just wanted to close by saying I literally could hardly agree more. And so I'll just end by imploring all of you, please call your congressman, please call your state rep, please call your local foundation, get your hair on fire, get their hair on fire. This really is just the most important challenge facing the city of Chicago right now. Uh, thank you very much. And with that, I look forward to introducing CEO Martinez. Good afternoon, everyone. I have a lot to cover, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna go through a lot. Um, and then hopefully, as we go through the panel, we'll also make some connections and, and really clar and clarifications. Um, so I wanna just, first of all, acknowledge my team that's here from CPS. We have quite a few people here. Um, I, I just tell you, I tell this to all my colleagues across the country, I have, I do have the most talented team in the country. So I just wanna, and by the way, that includes our teachers and paraprofessionals. <laughs> That is the number one reason why we're seeing the progress that we're making and we're building off of that. Um, I wanna thank our, uh, all of the individuals that helped put this event together and, and my fellow panelists. So first of all, let me just say this. I completely agree 
that the pandemic was an incredibly difficult time for students around the country, not just here in Chicago. I joined CPS in late 2021, and I saw from my first day on the job that we had to get to work immediately. Our charge was not just to uh, recover, that, wasn't an, that wouldn't, wouldn't have been enough, uh, even though we lost a lot of ground during the pandemic, but it was to accelerate learning so we could emerge even stronger. And the data that I'm gonna show you is showing, especially in reading, that that's what we're, we're doing right now, and we are on our way on math as well. Um, so as discussed earlier, we, we, there was a study by Harvard and Stanford who co-piloted a landmark study on the pandemic recovery. So it was very specific, using data from 30 states and state-specific standardized tests. Illinois, they gathered the data from what we call the IAR test, which is administered from grades three to eighth in both reading and math. And they collected three data points, everybody. 2019, pre-pandemic, 2020, and 2020, uh, 20, uh, sorry, 2019, 2022, and 2023. And the reason the 2019 and 22 is really important, that's when everybody saw the, the, the biggest declines. That truly in our, when later as people write about this, that is the true pandemic period. When, we, when you talk about loss of learning, that is that period. And then 23 being the last year that we just finished. These scores were then compared with other large city school districts, similar districts uh, in Illinois, uh, and also, uh, so we they compared multiple districts as well as the states to each other. So let me just get to the punchline. So what they found was that in literacy, out of 40 city districts analyzed by the Council of Great City Schools, CPS students made up the most ground in reading for the 22-23 school year. We also had the greatest net growth from 2019 to 20. So remember, remember that period we said 2019 to 22, that was the pandemic period. So even when you factor that loss, and you take in the gains we had last year, we had the highest net growth of anybody in the country. Uh, we're not just number one, um, we are also one of the four largest districts that came out of the pandemic better than we started. And I wanna be, be clear about what better means. Better means that we are building the momentum around academic gains and we're coming in stronger last year than we were even in previous years in terms of the momentum and the gains. CPS performance grew faster than the state as a whole and now pace similar districts in Illinois. And in fact, Illinois is only one of three states in the country where students overall emerge from the pandemic with higher scores than before the, the pandemic. And again, everybody, this is about momentum and gains. Um, by the way, that growth was driven largely by Chicago because again, we outperformed the state for the first time. What I really is exciting to me is that among large uh, urban districts, and let's call it like it is everybody, we are uh, a majority Latino black student school district, okay? That is who we are, we embrace it, let's own that. So it's not a surprise that who led the gains? So our black students in CPS saw the greatest growth during the recovery of 22-23 with the greatest net gains overall since the start of the pandemic. Latinx students saw the second highest growth and the highest net gains among large districts. In fact, CPS was the only, and this is something to really note for the national researchers, was the only large urban district in the country where Latinx students showed a net gain from 2019 to 2023. In math, and by the way, I will say this, we have, we had, we had a really strong focus in reading. So not that we didn't focus, I got my team here, I got Corey and Mary Beck and the teaching and learning team, Math is just getting started, okay? I just want to, make, reading, we were already in there deep, even, even as we were, as the pandemic was hitting us, math is just getting started. But we also did show, so the growth in math was not as dramatic, but CPS still ranked in the top third among large city schools in terms of growth from the, for the 22-23 school year. CPS outperformed, uh, in fact, we were 13 out of 43 large city districts and our students outpaced again the state of Illinois as a whole and similar Illinois districts in terms of recovery growth. Among large districts, black students were in the top third for the overall net change, again, from 2019 to 23, so that's even taking the loss, and the same was true for our Latinx students, in the top third with overall net change from 2019 to 2023. Ladies and gentlemen, this growth didn't happen by accident. Um, this was first, first most, again, I will double down on this. We built off the talent that was already in the district that had been built over many, many years. Our research partners have really shown that over time. 
But then what we also did is we then aligned our resources. We, we made, when we went back to, I'll tell you, to, to research-based strategies, best practices, uh, specifically around supporting the whole child to improve the instructional core, Again, research-based practices, spending our ESSER funding over time. God, the number of them. If you could go back and see the videos that, I was, that we were having during the board meetings of people coming saying, spend all the money now, the need is so great. And I kept saying, no, we need to build a multi-year plan. We, did, we built a blueprint. We said we need at least a three-year recovery plan. Year one, ladies and gentlemen, was last year. That's year one. We're in year two right now. And we use targeted universalism to make our investments. We provided universal resources for all schools, but we also targeted resources for students who needed the most. We empowered principals and, and with the discretionary funding to make the best local decisions. So we did the best of both worlds, everybody. We put some non-negotiables. We put a very strong academic vision, what we wanted. But at the same time, we also gave enough flexibility to principals to say, look, what things look like in Austin and Inglewood might look a little different than another part of the city. The one thing, uh, the one thing to, it's one thing to have a right strategy, but it's another thing to have the funding in place. And frankly, our federal aid allowed us to invest fully in day-to-day -day in what I would call bread and butter education. More teachers and increased professional development. Nothing glamorous about that, everybody. I have almost 2,000 more teachers today than I did pre-pandemic. High quality curriculum that's culturally relevant, that also has SEL strategies built in within the curriculum. Interventionist teachers at every single school for students that are falling behind. More programs outside the classroom, including out of school time and summer programs. And again, a very robust social and emotional learning set of supports. You know, one of the things that I always say, you know, in our world of education, we give teachers more tools, right? We give them better diagnostics, we give them different strategies, but we always say the same thing, hey, here you go, I'll check in on you later. What we did, everybody that was different in Chicago, we said no. Teachers have to focus on tier one instruction, they have to focus on SEL strategies, they gotta focus on the students feeling good about being in school again, because remember during the pandemic, kids weren't feeling good about school. Parents weren't feeling good. And then what we said is, but you don't do this by yourself. You're gonna have an intervention teacher. In our, in our schools that have the highest poverty rates, you're gonna have tutors. You're gonna have academic coaches that we hadn't had in 20 years. And we're going to give you the content and strategies and the diagnostics on top of that. And so everybody, we didn't say just go ahead. We said, no, focus on what you know you do best. Get to know our kids, understand where they're at, and meet them where they're at. Sorry, I get a little bit emotional about this. Um, <laughs> And we know that, and we know that, you know, we still have a ways to go on supporting our students, everybody. So no, this is the very beginning of the journey. Remember, it's year one of the recovery. And at a minimum, I said publicly, we need a three-year recovery plan. We're in year two now. And we know that we're doing this with not sufficient funding. Uh, we know that we've never been adequately funded, never been adequately funded by the state, according to its own evidence-based formula. And again, I say this, they didn't create this problem, everybody. They inherited this, but we gotta work together to solve it. And so it was only because of this federal pandemic aid that we could put in these types of resources. And for us, even as we look at the end of this year, uh, for next year, we're projecting a deficit of almost $400 million because our federal funding is leaving. And so just know what we're working on right now, the top priority is how do we sustain the investments that we know are working. And by the way, we're doing it together with our principals. And then I wanna you know, just talk about our tutor corps, again, as I was called out, these strategies were all working in sync with each other, everybody. There is no magic solution for education, but I gotta tell you, these tutors have become indispensable for us. You can see the numbers, over 600 tutors serving over 10,000 students in 229 schools. And, and right now, reading is the focus on K-5, to again, which is why we're seeing such significant gains in reading, and math has been the focus in six to 12. And so I, I just, I'll end with this, everybody, before we go to our panel, is that, you know, we're showing what is possible with a little bit of investment, but I want you to understand this. So imagine, imagine our city. Imagine the street of Madison Avenue. So you got the Austin neighborhood that at the very west end is Austin Avenue. And you're trying to get them to, to 42 West Madison, which is where our office is at, right? Right in the center, Dearborn and Madison. In between, you got these different neighborhoods. Where's Garfield? East Garfield. We got the South Loop. Our children are all across that path. Some of them are living right, right there in, in South Loop, right next to downtown. Some of them are living at the edge of Austin. And with the pandemic, some of them got pushed back even a couple of blocks. 
So the reality is that it's unrealistic to think everybody's gonna get to 42 West Madison at the same time. But what we're showing is that our students that were the furthest away made the highest gains. So that means they went from Austin all the way to West Garfield and give us a couple more years, they're gonna get to 42 West Madison. That is the, the main thing that I wanna share with you. Yes, there's a lot of risks, but if we work together, there is no limit. I can tell you right now, I'm seeing what's happening in our classrooms to the talent of our staff or the potential of our children. Thank you, everybody. <laughs> that way you don't, get, you don't hurt okay. your neck going back and forth. Well, we've heard, <clears throat> excuse me, We've heard a lot already, and, and we want to dive right into the panel. Um, I'm Lorraine Forte. I'm the editorial page editor for the Sun-Times. And education is one of the things that, that we really pay attention to when it comes to news. And um, as we've heard from Dr. Ludwig from University of Chicago Education Lab and from CEO Martinez, this is has been a, a a real health crisis and also a crisis for public education, but there are promising signs and we've, we, we want to talk in more, <clears throat> more depth about those. And also I want to introduce, in addition to Dr. Ludwig and, and CEO Martinez, uh, we have with us Laura Tone, PwC Chicago Office Managing Partner, and she is also the board chair of Kids for Chicago, which is a nonprofit that really focuses on getting families involved in Chicago schools. And she's also on the board of Start Early, which is a nonprofit that's focused on early childhood education. Um, let's dive right in because we're running a little behind. <laughs> um, Dr. Look, we heard some encouraging news from CEO Martinez about what's going on with test scores, what is your own sense of how things are going in Chicago? Yeah, let me, um, maybe, the, maybe the quick place that I would wanna start is to just um, say, oh, I love talking about test score trends. I have 50 slides on, no, no, I'm kidding. Um, <laughs> uh, the reason that it's much easier to track what's going on at the national level than at the local level is it's much easier to track a similar set of kids at the national level. In Chicago, between 2019 and 2023, we lost something like 30-ish thousand kids from the school system. And so you know, the, the Harvard and Stanford study is, um, what they're doing is super helpful. They're trying to give us a picture of how things are changing. But they're looking at average test scores for di basically different groups of kids in 2019 to 2023. And so we've looked at the data trying to hold the composition of kids in, in Chicago constant. And um, CEO Martinez is absolutely right that CPS has done an incredible job with reading in the early grades. So we see in the data, not that the kids are up relative to, to pandemic, uh, pre-pandemic period, but they've caught up in reading, which is an incredible accomplishment given the challenges. But in math in the early grades, kids are still really far behind. And when you look at high school age kids, they're really behind in both reading and math. And I don't intend this at all as a criticism of CPS. Like I, this is a historic challenge that our public schools have been asked to, to wrestle with in our kids and our parents. It's just intrinsically hard. Every school system around the world is wrestling with it. And I think the, the main thing that I just want to um, exhort people to, CPS knows what they're doing, they just need more help doing it. And so I don't mean to criticize the Harvard study or what CPS is doing, but just to point out, we do have much more that, that we need to do. Okay. Uh, CEO Martinez, you talked a bit about the progress you've seen, but can you kind of take us from point A to B, how, what you saw in terms of the impact of the pandemic on learning, and then how a little more about how that has improved since sure, sure, absolutely. since 2020. Yeah, and so so a couple of things. One is one of the things we saw nationwide is that our youngest children actually struggled the most. So if you were a parent during that time, you know exactly what I mean. Virtual learning was not built for our youngest children. Our older children did better, but what suffered at, in the high school grades was rigor. 
because it is just very difficult to implement the same level of rigor uh, in any kind of virtual setting uh, that isn't in person. And so that's what we saw, that's what the data saw. What was interesting was that when, and we also had challenges just in operating the schools. When the children were out for so long, we had so many challenges because we became not just an educational institution, we had to worry about healthcare. We had to worry about doing things in this new environment that we were all trying to figure out and people were still learning about this pandemic. What we were able to do though is refocus on who we are and what we're best at, which is academics. And so we were able to put in the structures in place to both support teachers and students. This federal funding, which we knew was one time, uh, we said, look, how do we best use this, not just to improve what's happening today, but to make the system stronger? So we did what we were told not to do. I added over 4,000 staff, and I say that unapologetically. You know, we made sure that schools had the funding for the first time that they never had before. And what happened? We saw academic gains at scale. Who benefited the most? It was our schools that had the children in the highest poverty rates. It was our schools who had struggled with, the, with this infrastructure and resource that they just hadn't had. And so that is what's happening today. And what I will tell you is that in the meantime, because we don't have as much time with our high school students, what did we do? We made sure we had record graduation rates over the pandemic period. We also doubled down on college credit. So we wanted students to be better prepared. We're seeing some of the highest college going rates that we've seen, uh, even historically, and we even saw a, an increase in students staying in school. So we didn't give up on the high schools, but we did see that we did see loss, you know, a loss of rigor during that pandemic period, and now we're bouncing right back. So what I tell our staff is imagine when these students that are in elementary school today, imagine when they're in high school in the next few years because we're, we're building up their strength. And math, by the way, is just getting started. So we're still proud of the gains we made, but it's absolutely true. We, we had a real true, true focus on literacy because that scared us. It scared us when we saw those proficiency rates go down. And we know that reading is the foundation of math. Because if you look at what math is today, it's application, it's problem solving. You cannot do that if you're not, a, if you're not literate. And so we focused on literacy first and wait when you start seeing also the acceleration in math, which we're starting to see already. Okay. Uh, Laura, can you talk a bit about uh, your perspective as someone in the, the business community about the importance of this issue to the business community and to the economic growth of the city as a whole. Jens talked a bit about that, but what's your perspective as a business person? Yeah, thank you. Um, as, a, as a leader um, and an employer, we employ more than 4,000 people here in Chicago, um, and particularly in my business, which is professional services, talent is everything. Mm -hmm. um, Michael Fastnot, the CEO of World Business Chicago, recently commented in a Cranes article that the number one priority for businesses thinking about relocating, expanding, or growing here in Chicago is the talent. Our students can't afford to be forever behind because of pandemic, pandemic learning loss, and frankly, neither can our greater Chicago economic environment. But even more than that, I would argue that a strong, inclusive, high-quality public education system is fundamental for our ability to thrive in a global economy in the future. If you think about, it, it's not stating the obvious, but building a pipeline of diverse talent is fundamentally critical. But equal to that is creating an inclusive public education system that as people come to Chicago, they ask themselves, do I want to relocate here? Do I want to live here? Mm -hmm. And one of the top questions asked is, will my child get a good education? So for all of those reasons, it's, it's critical. Yeah, do, do you see um, value in investing in this? Can you talk a, a yeah. bit about that? I, I absolutely will, and I'll start with the, the concept of me talking about this topic with these two colleagues next to me is overwhelming. So um, I'm certainly <laughs> not an educator, and I have such extraordinary and immense respect for, I see many people I've worked with over the years who are mm -hmm. teachers and are doing what you're doing, and I have so much respect for your commitment and long-term passion. Um, so not an educator, but what I do know has shown me that integrated, differentiated instruction that meets our students where they're at is so fundamentally critical, and investing in that, and that can include high dosage tutoring, investment in tutoring, so important. But I also wanna make sure we're thinking 
about long-term investment too. Mm -hmm. um, learning loss, as far as the little I know, isn't new. And I think a lot of our highest need students have suffered disproportionate learning loss even before the pandemic. So to me, what's really important is investment that takes a long-term lens mm -hmm. and not just, That's right. Not just thinking that this could be a one and done and, and over to make sure we're continually investing not only in growth and recovery, but long-term proficiency in our students. Okay, I want to get back to that, but uh, Jens, is there anything else based on your research that you think should be happening? I mean, we've heard a lot about tutoring and... So is there anything based on your research that you think need, else needs to be happening? Yeah, I think uh, you know what, one of the things that um, we've been doing a lot of work with CPS on is thinking about how to uh, scale tutoring in a world in which there's not enough money. So the, the federal assistance to districts, $190 billion, sounds like a lot of money. Mm -hmm. It was spread out over multiple years, and we spend a ton on K-12 education in the US. So it was about a 6% increase in annual K-12 spending. 6% more money every year is not enough in a world in which we're coming through the 100-year flood for public education, right? So we as a country have been behind the eight ball from the beginning with this, with this whole thing. So we're trying to work with CPS and other districts around the country to figure out how to solve the problem of not enough money and not enough tutors. We go around to districts around the country and talk to them about tutoring, and they say things like, we can't, we can't even hire teachers. How do you expect us to hire tutors? And so one of the things that we have been trying with CPS and other districts is ways to selectively incorporate technology mm -hmm. to substitute at least a little bit on the margin for tutor time as a way to bring down costs and bring down the number of tutors that you need. And I think in, in small doses, we found some, some, some way to, to, to do that and, and greatly expand. And I think... That's important because, you know, I think one of the key things about technology is, I, I hate to use the term diminishing marginal returns, but I can't help myself. So, like, if you, if you think about time on, on in front of a computer for kids, the 20, as we all saw in Zoom, the 20th hour, I have an 11-year-old at home. Her 20th hour on Zoom per week <clears throat> was a disaster. But her first hour on the <laughs> computer was really productive. Mm -hmm. And, you know, when we think about diminishing marginal returns, we usually think it sucks when you do a lot of it. But the flip of that is the initial parts can be really helpful. And I think CPS gets a lot of credit in thinking about how to be smart in using a little bit of technology. And the, and the reason I say is that lots of parents who have seen their kid burn out on the computer in Zoom have a reflexive anti-technology reaction, which I, I get, having seen my own daughter go through that. And what I want to remind us of is the computer is not the enemy. It's the 20th hour on the computer that's the enemy. Okay. Okay. Uh, CEO, you, you mentioned uh, you know, the, uh, the need or the, uh, yeah, the imperative to spend the, the federal pandemic money wisely. And that's going to soon run out. So. What's the next step? What, what needs to happen? Yeah, I mean, so first of all, you know, one of the things that we were very intentional about is we did not want to do, um, you know, some immediate fix, quick fix, test prep, drill, and I won't say the second word, you know, um, you know, with kids. Uh, what we said was we're going to invest, first of all, in our people. We're going to build our capacity. We're going to build systems. Because I'll tell you, I can't put a price of, of giving planning time to teachers where they're looking at where kids are at, where they're actually saying, you know, here's what's happening in my instruction, in my classroom, but I notice, you know, that when we match them up with this particular tutor or they're in an after-school program, we're seeing this, right? Both, by the, by the way, academically and socially, because as parents, we know that during this era, our students, our children, had so many challenges that went beyond academics. Mm -hmm. And so those structures are in place today. And they're in place across the system at scale in a way that, that not because of, of not a lack of want, not wanting to do it, we just never had the resources to put it in place the way we have. And so we now have, and, what, and the way we laid out the funding, everybody, is we said, look, year two recoveries this year. So by the way, I'm making this prediction right now. The gains you saw last year, they're going to continue. 
Okay, so there is, there is not a one, there's nothing that we put in place that grow the results that is this one wonderful thing that happened one year. It is systems that are in place that are gonna continue, and in fact, they'll probably even get stronger this year because we were trying to figure it out last year. Imagine trying to put all these things in place all at once in a system our size. So anybody who's managed a large organization, that is really tough to do. So it's only gonna get stronger this year. My number one priority is how do we continue to next year? So we work with our principals and said, and we put, asked them point blank, tell us what is it that's driving success in your school? And they laid it out for us. So we are now making the tough decisions of going through our budgets and saying, okay, what is not on this list? And by the way, it's not things that are great, everybody. By the way, we spent over $100 million on our, in repairs on our, on our buildings, emergency repairs. And I'm asking the team, can we scale that back? Can we scale that back? And I get it, like, you know, like kids have to be safe, they gotta be warm and dry in our schools, but what is an emergency repair? Because my principals have a lot, of, a lot of pride, and they want their schools to, be, to look nice, right? And so they'll look at us and say, hey, I need to fix that tile over there, and say, okay, is it leaking? Right, I mean, those are the conversations we're having. We bought devices for every single student, iPads, Chromebooks, notebooks. Again, I can't do that again, so what can we do in a, in a strategic way and so those are the things we're having, those conversations. This will continue. So the way we laid out the funding, we, we said we'll, we'll deal with half of it being gone for next year and the other half the year after. So the, the shortfall is actually doubled. It's almost closer to 700 million. We're dealing now closer to a $300 million deficit for next year. And by the way, I'm gonna be advocating. I'm advocating with the mayor. I'm advocating with Springfield. I'm advocating with Secretary Carmona, who's very, very supportive of the work we're doing here, very complimentary, and saying, look, we, are, we want to show the country what's possible. Allow us to continue to do this, and you will continue to see these types of gains. Mm -hmm. Laura, do you see a, a role for business and, and perhaps philanthropy, because you, you work with two nonprofits, in helping to keep this going? And, and how, you yeah. know, of course people will say money, but then what else can be done? Yeah. Um, the Chicago business and philanthropic community has a long history of Helping, in, helping to invest in our, our public education system. Um, whether I think about direct investments of companies like ITW or aerial investment in actual campuses, or I think about organizations, ours included, who do invest a significant amount of time in tutoring and mentoring, um, or even just being supportive with our voice about asking for full funding for Chicago public schools as is permitted and required under the, the state funding formula. I think continuing to do those things can, can be critical. Um, I also think it's really important that we, as business and philanthropy, think about what are those long-term investments that address the whole student, right. starting from the, earliest, the very earliest moments of learning, even before they enter a, a traditional classroom, um, because making sure we're thinking about that investment long-term, again, is so important. And I also think we need to make sure we listen to parent voice. You know, I, I think there's inherently a lot of bias with all the stakeholders out there in, in the community around us, but I think parents have one bias, and that's what's best for their child. So engaging and listening to, to parents and families as we think about investment is important. Mm -hmm. uh, this is a question for, for everybody. Um, is there any, or are there specific things you see, be, besides what you've mentioned, that make you optimistic about the future and about keeping this momentum going. You know, you, we've heard a lot about tutoring, helping, and technology, and getting business folks involved, but are there specific things that you can talk about that make you optimistic that, you know, you think more people can get involved in? Yeah, I mean, I, you know, I can't stop talking about this. Um, <laughs> and I'll sound like a broken record, everybody. You know, the fact that even today, with the pandemic, uh, you know, challenges that we had, year over year record graduation rates, college credits, 125,000 college credits that were a record last year. And by the way, my class of 23, were the be they were at the beginning of the pandemic. They were freshmen at the beginning of the pandemic. So think about it. That was my first graduating class. So to your point about that, I would have shown like, oh my God, these children are gonna fall off the cliff. They're all gonna drop out. They're all gonna be blah, blah, blah. No, they graduated one of my strongest graduating classes ever in every single measure in terms of college credits, graduation rates, college going rates, scholarships, and they beat the record of the year before. And this is before 
the children that are coming up, for example, my eighth graders had the highest uh, passing rates for algebra of any of our groups, and now it's available to every single school in our district. Why? Because we're leveraging technology. I have amazing high school teachers that are teaching the students virtually while they're in their elementary schools, and they're literally learning from them. And we're doing those kind of strategies, and we've expanded access to those kind of coursework. So we're just beginning. It's the first inning of a baseball. So remember, three-year recovery, three-year recovery, year one was last year. This year is only going to get stronger, but what does it require? It requires everybody. The district by itself cannot do it all, and the one request I'm going to make everybody, we are an educational institution, everybody. Look, I tell my teachers every day, you're trying to solve for poverty. That is the challenge you have. Your children are coming in below grade level, but we, I can't solve affordable housing. I can't solve hex, having access to health care. I can't solve living wages as you saw as you were coming in, right? I mean, these things that are, these pressures come on, come on us. And look, I will advocate right with everybody. Like, sign me up. Where do, where do I sign up? But if it's put on the district to solve everything, that's just not fair. That's not fair to our teachers and our staff. Let us do what we do best, and we're showing you what's possible with just enough investment. Yeah, um, I'm, I'm an optimistic person to begin with. So yes, I'm optimistic. Um, but I'm optimistic for a few reasons. One, I think the work that um, CEO Martinez has talked about today. I think if we look back the 20 plus years before the pandemic, Chicago experienced some real growth That's in right. our graduation rates. I think it was 50 to above 80%. That's right. um, so there, there's momentum, I think, that provides an optimistic point of view. Um, uh, Penny Sebring and a number of her colleagues, and I wish I could remember them off the cuff, but I don't, uh, wrote a book recently called How a City Learned to Improve Its Schools. And that looks at uh, 20 plus years ago here in Chicago when CPS, business and philanthropy came together to each contribute to improving our public schools and the and results were impactful. And so I'm optimistic because I know in partnership We've done it before, and it can happen again. Uh, I will end with a slightly cornier version of that, but yeah. very heartfelt. So <laughs> I was a professor at Georgetown University in DC for 12 years before I moved to the University of Chicago. And one of the things that was really striking about living in DC is that the city was just sort of a soundstage for people to try and claw their way to the top of the federal government. It was just like a backdrop. And everyone knew that in a few years they'd just be living somewhere else, and so sort of who cares? And the biggest revelation to me in moving to Chicago is how many people deeply love the city. Yes. That was really, really new to me. And I think this cuts through everything that, that you said. And I think at heart, that is the, that's sort of the, the root cause of all the good things at some level that, uh, that happen here. And, and that's what makes me fundamentally optimistic. Mm -hmm. Um, I, I think we do have time for some audience questions, and I, I do have a couple of pre-submitted ones. And I, I want to go to this one because it was mentioned briefly, but they didn't, we didn't talk about it in detail. Um, one audience uh, member submitted one of these, this question. In addressing uh, the long-term impact of the pandemic on education, what role do you see for social-emotional learning and mental health support for students and educators. Yeah, so, so, so let me start that off. So we know this, and we know this as parents, we know this as employers. Our staff and our students need more support than ever. Um, it's easy to say, well, the pandemic is behind us. There's no more trauma. The reality is all of our data shows the opposite. It is why the reason we still have high absenteeism rates, you see it both with employees as well with, as with children. And what I will tell you is that now, I'm very proud of the work we're doing in our district, but I can tell you this is a great example where it only works if we're leveraging our communities, our community partners, our community uh, you know, not-for-profits. It's everybody coming together. And if we do that well, again, this will be one of the challenges that we'll overcome because it is a challenge as we think about our progress we're trying to make. Mm -hmm. uh, another question we have. Uh, the leadership of the schools is changing to an elected school board. Why are you confident that uh, these programs will continue? And that is a big point. That is going to be a big shift. So. I mean, I'll take a quick stab, but I, I want my colleague. Yeah, then. So, so here's what I will say about Chicago that makes Chicago very special. Um, and I say this to my principals all the time. 
When we do the work in a way where it is including our staff, our teachers, our principals, our paraprofessionals, we might have disagreements on other things, by the way, but when we, don't, when we agree on what's best for children and what those supports look like, which, which is what we've shown, these will sustain because the schools, the one thing that I love about our district is as much as they also love their city, they also love their children and they want the best for their children. What they ask for is just give me the ability to be successful, <laughs> enable me to be successful, give me the support systems. Look, I signed on for this, but, but give me that, that support. And when we do that, and what the, the data has shown historically over the last two decades, when you do that at the school level, even with changes in leadership, changes in board members, these results will sustain. And so for me, that's what makes me cautiously optimistic that it will be of course, you know, I'm selfish, but I, I want to accelerate even more. I want to press the gas pedal even more. And so that's always the, the push that we're trying to do in, you know, for our staff is how do we even accelerate even faster? Mm -hmm. Does the shift to an elected board uh, change how either one of you think about what may happen? Or, do you, or any thoughts on that from your perspective? Laura? No, go ahead. Laura, <laughs> Laura because you're like the hot history. potato third rail. Well, um, that, not really. It's no, I, you know, I, I'm optimistic because it creates an opportunity for the voice I talked about earlier. Hmm. So, you know, I, I think there's an opportunity for more of that voice to be represented at the school board level. Um, I also, that's part of why I was also so focused before on that long-term investment, because I, I think the empirical data would show, again, I'm not an educator, but I think the empirical data would show that good differentiated instruction that meets students where they're at delivers outcomes. And no matter who's sitting on a school board, that empirical right. data should support right. that long-term view. Mm -hmm. yeah. Uh, you mentioned, uh, Jens, earlier you mentioned uh, the role of technology in helping to close the learning gap. And one of the questions was about technology and the role that technology plays. Can you, is there, do you see it uh, playing more of a role in Chicago than maybe in other districts? Or have you looked at that? Or? Yeah, it's, uh, you know, I'm, um, I'm old enough to remember when, when I was in school back in the 1890s, and they, they invented film strips. That's how old I am. And everyone was like, oh, we're not going to need teachers anymore. We've got film strips. And then it was like, we've got cassette tapes. We don't need teachers. We've got right. cassette tapes. And um, so there's always, there's always something. And then we've got the computer, and now we've got artificial intelligence. And so... You know, one question I always have whenever someone says, oh, we've, this is the next big thing, is like, I, I remember film strips, and that did <laughs> not get rid of all the teachers at Lenape High School and in, uh, in southern New Jersey. Uh, but there is the possibility that artificial intelligence might be the quantum leap for, for education. I say might be, because we don't know. And the reason is, for something that I think is a particularly big challenge in Chicago for the reasons that we've talked about, is, you know, the the challenge for Chicago is the enormous variability across neighborhoods and even within neighborhoods in the circumstances of different kids and different families. Mm -hmm. And that means that what individual kids and families need is very particular and individualized. Mm -hmm. And that's very, very hard for schools to do that are resource constrained and do that at scale. And that is the, the thing that artificial intelligence creates the possibility of, right? So when you go to Google and you want to find the best Mexican restaurant in Ulaanbaatar, Mongolia, Google will tell you what that is, right? The most idiosyncratic, specific to you thing AI can help solve. And I think that's the big open question that we are all sitting here together waiting to see is, I think it's clear that AI does not have that potential yet. But we could also see the technology is changing at an astonishing rate. And so what that looks like two years in the future, even, I think we'll have to keep our fingers crossed. Okay. I was getting a signal, but I'm going to do this one last question. <laughs> <laughs> is there a long-term plan to address economic inequities between schools within the district? Many of the gains mentioned seem to be supported by intentional investment in under-resourced schools. So is there a long-term plan? Yeah, so I'll say this. Regardless of 
you know, changes in governance, one thing that I can tell that is going to be consistent, which is we're going to continue to fund and resource schools that have higher needs. We're doing it already. We're showing what's possible. Um, and frankly, you know, we're just going to get even more intentional, more strategic. So I'll just give you an example. Today, I can tell all of you, it is not a resource question about whether schools are, uh, not that they have enough, but whether they have more and if it's and that it's differentiated based on need, that exists today. You can look at my schools that have the highest needs, they have the most resources. The challenge is that talent's not equitably, equi equitably distributed. So in other words, we have more vacancies in certain schools, certain parts of town. So there now, it's not a resource question anymore, is can I find the talent? And then how do we keep the talent there? And that goes back to what I shared with everybody. If a teacher feels overwhelmed, because they're dealing with children that have significant challenges at home, a lot of poverty, they're sin significantly behind. By the way, our college education don't teach that. They give some strategies, but that's not the, their focus. And so if we can provide those supports to those teachers, keep them in those schools, attract, create support uh, systems, right, so that there's more of them, not just one or two. So those are the things we're having conversations about now. It's not a resource question. It is how do we make sure we get talent to where it's needed? What incentives can we do, right? And so those are conversations that I'm going to have with my union partners. And then, of course, continuing to advocate for more resources because on a percentage basis, it's not a lot. And what we're doing, everybody, with that small percentage of increase, you know, five, six percent, we're getting gains at scale and we're showing the nation that we can outperform the nation. And that's just in year one. Can I just add one, yes. one thing to this? Yes, Sorry. I was just gonna a, let everyone wrap up with what do you wanna leave people with today? Just on the, on the long-term sustainability point, I just wanna um, make the argument as, as an economist that like all, all of these investments in the school system, we, they are investments. We will get the money back, mm -hmm. right? So you've heard, like yeah. this is the most important thing for the economic growth of the city of Chicago. And there are vicious cycles and there are virtuous cycles for cities. And I think letting the public school system bleed resources is, is the perfect way to start a vicious cycle for a city. Because that leads to kids who are not competitive in the new economy that leads to a city that's not growing, that leads to businesses not coming, that leads to people leaving, that leads to depleted tax base, and so on. All of that can be turned around and spun up in the opposite direction if we're forward looking. I think, you know, in our daily, in our normal lives as, as normal people, we, you know, we are always worried about going on vacation or buying the couch or the new drapes, because we're like, how can we afford that? And so there's always a part of us that's a little, resistant or reluctant to spend money when you're in a budget challenge. Mm -hmm. But this is not a vacation. This is not buying drapes. This is not, like, it is genuinely an investment that's critical for the future of the city of Chicago. Laura? Um, what I want to leave people with? Yeah. Um, and that maybe I'll speak as a member of the business community. I, I mentioned, I think we have a really rich history here in Chicago of, of being civically engaged and leaning in and supporting um, our, our Chicago public education, and I'd ask that we keep doing that in all of the different creative ways that one can make those investments, and that we think about listening to the voice of those closest to the students, such as parents, and we think about the student from the very, very moment they, they become through their entire academic journey, because I think it is all so important. Mm -hmm. And I'll just say again, um, we're in the first inning of this. We really are. And, but what we're seeing is so promising. And this is just the beginning. So again, imagine as our students continue, as they're, they're gaining in academics, they're, they're, they're getting, they're, we're building up their armor. Imagine as they, as they matriculate through our grades, as I tell our families, if your children are in elementary school, I'll tell you, I am so optimistic for your children. But even our children in high school, our high schools right now are making sure that children are not only graduating, they're better prepared, they have options. We have amazing partnerships we've built with the trades that we'll be talking more and more about. And so for us, we see nothing but opportunity because we have the talent and we have the capacity. We just need to work together and we just need, and please, I just need you to continue to support us because we're gonna continue to show you that we're gonna outperform both the state and the nation. Well, thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
I feel like they deserve a much more rousing, don't go anywhere. <laughs> Where are you going? <laughs> they were like ready to go. More questions. I know we're running a few minutes behind, but um, I feel like they need a much more rousing round of applause because this is, um, yeah. the tough stuff and um, if you're an educator in any sort of way any capacity please show your hand yeah I tip my hat to you guys. I'm I think you all should be paid what radiologists are paid I don't know I don't get it I don't get it and I know because I had a few in uh, not in the Chicago public schools but in, I, I bless and honor every Oak Park teacher that had to deal with mine so <laughs> It was something else. Um, to Lorraine and to Pedro and to Laura and to um, Dr. Ludwig, thank you so much. On behalf of um, our CEO, Dan Gibbons, who is not here today. I know many of you are looking for him, but he is not here today. Uh, you get me. And um, the rest of our board, thank you all for being here. This is where we hold the conversation. And um, I love it when I see a room full of people, but more importantly, I love it when I see a room full of people trying to solve the problem. And that's what I see here over and over. When I came into the room, I heard somebody saying, well, wait, if we look at it like this, and I was like, that's what this should be about. So thank you all for your attention and your time today. And you had lemon cookies, so, you know. Um, I don't know, Amanda, um, Amanda and our, our staff is wonderful. Can we give our City Club staff a word? They make this happen. They literally make this happen. They just make it look like it's easy for me. So to each one of the, of the panelists, we thank you. We're going to ask you to stay up here for a quick photo, because I'm sure there are 300 people out there that want to speak with you. But we'll make this quick. Thank you all so much. And um, look forward to seeing you at the next discussion. If you are looking to come to any of the programs coming up, make sure that you get your reservation in early, uh, because there is sometimes tends to be no room in the end when you call too late. So thank you so much, and we are adjourned.